or bit or whatever. So basically what I actually did, I used one bit delays in here. And it's also not delays that are really very long, but there's only just eight steps, eight memory locations of one bit. So what actually happens, it is a, that sort of a, a memory is actually called a shift register, a very simple, uh, less than one euro chip. And uh, you, it, 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 uh, it, uh, you can put data in it, and then you can clock the data and one oscillator uh, sources the data and the other clocks the data and then at the end of the delay line the last three bits are converted back into an analog eight level signal and that basically comes back into the frequencies of the oscillator and uh, the time of the filter and uh, because it's all voltage controls you can sort of uh, create these sounds and play it that way so I'm trying to think of this can we get a good crumbling sound, maybe from this actually. that actually has 12 knobs and that is called the blipper box and there's a 
certain, uh, that's, uh, I built about 50 of these, and they are uh, used by musicians <laughs> all over the world. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah. Then, uh, of course, uh, I thought, because if you build this kind of stuff, everything is hand-built, you know, I, I etched uh, the circuit boards myself, uh, oh, really? uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Of all the stuff, everything is totally hand-built. That's amazing, basically a little bit of my uh, artistic background, my artistic training, maybe, that I would like to do that. But now I thought it's also interesting to make this available to uh, a, a wider public that, that, that don't really have to so much money, so let's put this into a sort of a do-it-yourself project. And at first I thought about uh, releasing it as a kit, but uh, of course it is a, it is a, it is a, it is a sort of medium uh, uh, difficulty kit, and then when you sell them over the internet as a kit, you get all these people uh, emailing you like, I put it together and it doesn't do anything. What did I do wrong? Well, plug it in. <laughs> no, you weren't there. You don't know. So then I thought, well, maybe it's a very good idea to put this into like a workshop situation, where people come to the workshop and they get a kit, and then together we, <coughs> you know, like Joke and Richard and me, we just let them build the kits, and uh, then at the end of the workshop we test all the uh, kits and make sure that they work before they go home. And uh, well, we did it in a lot of places all over the world and uh, so it uh, this is the best one. Feel free to book any of these people for workshops and then you know. so I'm, I'm, I would love to come. Two workshops this time. Yeah. 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 So if you missed the first two, yeah. I will get out of the way so that I'm not in front of you on the internet. Um, yeah, hello. <laughs> we are Tim and Pumami. Um, I'm Tim from Switzerland, and Pumarini is from Japan. And uh, it's funny because I actually met in the Netherlands, in Utrecht, in 2003. We found out, it was a Santa Claus party. <laughs> <laughs> we found out uh, that we both have a musical background. <coughs> oh, <that's laughs> we both have a musical background and Pomerini was singing in a punk band in Tokyo and I did electronic music in Zurich. And we, oh, um, we, did some, uh, we did some recordings, like four songs. And then Pomerini had to go back to Japan and uh, I went back to Zurich. So we had this split situation, like she was in Japan, I was in uh, Zurich, and we found out that we can do concerts via Skype. So Pumarini was singing from her kitchen in Tokyo at 6 in the morning to my live show. I was playing at midnight in Zurich or probably or somewhere. And that was quite interesting. But uh, <laughs> stop touching me, I also didn't touch you. <laughs> Nah. <laughs> 
<laughs> the budget is too low. But anyway, I can because it is a cucumber. And uh, no. that, that works better. Well. Okay, so let's yeah. go. One, two, one, two, three. I feel good. I know that I work now. So we play a last song. It's the apple. The computer could find it. Yeah, I, actually, I start with an apple, so that's why I made this little uh, sticker on there. But the cucumber is better because it's uh, linear, so you can play it. <laughs>
Yeah, the, the, the main sounding part is actually a metal disc. Um, it first started out actually a, it's a bit of a reverse thing. Normally, uh, you try to maybe make an acoustic sound into an electronic one. It was very popular for a while, but since I, this one actually kind of came the other way around. I made something in the computer, and I wanted it to become real. Uh, that's uh, actually with this one, uh, Ferrofon I call it. Uh, it's a, uh, yeah, two discs with nails in it. And it scrapes nails over metal discs. It can be quite nasty. Um, I think I'll just give it a spin. Yeah? So, but you made, the, you made the computer sound first. Yeah. And then made this. How did you make the computer sound? Or what was that? Uh, the computer sound was, uh, yeah, I was working on a project. It was uh, just a sound design bit where I was using It just sounded like something that should be real. Yeah. So then I decided to work on that. So here it is. Yeah, let's hear it. I do have to say, I do feel bad that we can't amplify that more, because just standing next to it, I'm hearing great sounds that maybe you can't it's, hear in the audience. Yeah, it's quite difficult. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but I can show the other one, which gets amplified a bit better. Okay. Uh, so another uh, little instrument here. Uh, this one um, I call uh, Sono Plotter, because it kind of works like these old-fashioned plotters where you have a pen. Uh, you can, this bit can move forward and backwards, and this one can move sideways. Uh, in these metal discs, there are uh, three springs stretched in, and uh, this little device is, uh, well, for now, I would have to call it still an attempt at making a continuous bow. Uh, this is uh, just a PVC. Uh, it can bow the uh, springs that are in here. And, well, my idea would be a, a yeah, seamless, continuous bow, but uh, that's not so easy. <laughs> there is a seam in here, so it kind of makes a rhythm as well, which I prefer to like. Um, yeah, let's play a little bit here. <laughs>
disc. You get this nice rumbling sound. and beautiful sounds. The last thing I wanted to ask you about is I see something that looks like an Arduino over here. Yeah? yeah. And I'm not sure what's in, in there. Is it, these are both Arduino control projects? Um, yeah, this one uh, I made uh, before I ever got an Arduino. So this one is just an AVR program myself. Um, so it's Arduino-like, very much so. Um, and the idea with this one is uh, using Arduino because eventually I would like to be able to uh, also partially automate it. Uh, often I perform with it and do lots of computer processing at the same time. So I sometimes want to step away from the instrument and leave it doing its thing. And then it would be great if I could have a bit more control than just it running. Uh, so that's, yeah, I, I decided to go to the <coughs> that there was more stuff available already so that I could, you know, think about my creative things and not redesign the wheel every time. Right. Just design your wheel. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so every, I don't know if people know the, this, these terms that we're throwing around. The Arduino is an uh, open source hardware platform, rapid prototyping platform. So A R D U I N O dot C C Arduino. But a lot of the projects that you're seeing, what's uh, always extraordinary is all this variety, all this, all these very different projects that you're seeing have at their basis some common shared elements. So the Arduino is in several of these projects. The, the sort of the, a lot of this, the basic circuit that you saw with the cucumber is is an essential circuit that underlies a lot of a lot of the stuff that we do, the sensors and everything else. So there are um, there are all of these common elements that, that we share in the same way that we share musical scales and rhythm and notation and things. Or not, <laughs> and didn't tell that many people, and we still got all of this. You know all of these contributions, and I have to say, some of the people who I think we didn't um, get on stage or out in the audience, and the projects that we rejected were also as as good. Um, we we just had a limited amount of time and, and space on stage, so the the quantity and quality of the projects that are out there um, has been impressive to me. Maybe maybe that's to you, but I, it's been very impressive to me. <coughs> Introduce yourself, sir. <laughs> Hello, man. So I'm, my name is Shin Dao. I'm from Japan, so I live in uh, now so in Berlin. And uh, so my uh, so I'm working with uh, so uh, two uh, fields. So one is performance with my self-made instrument uh, with a sensor system and uh, uh, sound insertion object, more like a so fine art so field. And uh, so this instrument is uh, I built in 2006, and uh, yeah, so I'm working so uh, so five years, and uh, yeah, so that is actually so um, uh, it seems it's so classical uh, one, but uh, you never seen so this <laughs> instrument uh, so I think, and uh, that is it's actually acoustic. So acoustic instrument, but uh, uh, inside uh, inside uh, this body um, uh, the, of this instrument, uh, there is one so tilt sensor inside, and uh, that means so my body movement so uh, um, so change the sound. So for example,
Yeah, so actually, so uh, this uh, this instrument it was so uh, so duo so project so one so another so guy so make uh, so frame uh, with um, actually yesterday have you been in concert uh, on, uh, of uh, uh, Alex Novitz and uh, so he he making so fantastic so uh, so performance with uh, Nintendo Wii controller and uh, we made actually so. Uh, before, so more like uh, uh, like V, but uh, uh, another so form, and uh, he and uh, performed so Miyama, Chikashi Miyama. Uh, so he uh, makes also um, he uses also uh, his voice, and uh, and I so I'm so um, this so string instrument, so that is a so sensor instrument for this one. And uh, now is uh, we are so more like we are making a so solo project, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, let's, I guess let's hear a little bit. Yeah? Shall we hear a little bit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think so five or six minutes, uh, so make it some more. Please, take yeah. it away. <laughs> yeah.
Do you have a category for this kind of instrument? I, um, I was just thinking, you hear terms like electroacoustic, or hyper instrument, which I guess came out of um, research at, I think, the MIT Media Lab was the first to coin that. But what would you do, how would you describe this? Uh, so, is it the Katsuri? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so, <laughs> it's, it's a good question, so. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> awesome. So, awesome. So, so actually, <laughs> awesome instrument. So, idea, idea. So, uh, the, the idea so far me is uh, the. Housing, but I also love to play Bach. Um, I'm also an electrical engineer, and about three years ago, I, I began to focus on building new electronic musical instruments and also just taking them on stage and playing them. Um, just before I play, I just wanted to talk about some ideas that I keep in mind building this instrument instruments I've built in the past and instruments moving forward. So first I think about the relationship of a musical instrument to the performer and to the music. Um, in terms of music, which is made up of sound, um, I want my instruments to have access to many dimensions of sound with as much nuance as I can. Um, it's kind of difficult with electronics, um, with acoustic systems, just with um, just Newtonian physics and the way uh, physical bodies um, relate with input energy. Um, it's, anyway, I want to make a lot of nuance. Um, in terms of the relationship between the instrument and the performer, I think of the instrument as an extension of, of the human. I don't want the instrument to be the piece and to play only one piece and to make the music for the person. I, I want the uh, music to originate from the musician, or the performer um, themselves. Um, because with electronics, we can have infinite mappings of input gesture and output sound. Um, we can't do everything at all times. So um, my approach is I just, I just pick what I can and can't do. So once you have those constraints, uh, you can create a new vocabulary of sounds and physical gestures that map to those sounds. Um, but then when you have those fundamental elements, you can then compose things. You can improvise things. I mean, I don't, I don't really consider myself a composer, more of an improviser, but I would love to have my instruments given to a composer, maybe different, five different composers, and have them write drastically different pieces for it, and not have a boring concert of all air marimba. Uh, I'm not quite there yet, but that's what I would like. Um, I've actually practiced this thing quite a bit. I mean, it's only a year old. So um, I've developed some familiarity with how it sounds based on what I do, so I can kind of think um, in the language of the air marimba, um, but I'm going to continue to practice and see where that goes. Coming from an acoustic musician performer perspective, I, I really appreciate the, the issue of learning and practice and how much depth you can get with developing a strong connection with your instrument over time. So it's kind of a weird thing to build something you're not going to be quite good at yet, but you want to, I, I want to build um, sort of a platform that later on I can find new things that I didn't envision at first. Shall we, uh, shall we hear it? Thank you. 
Thank you. So there are two questions for you. One is, let's first talk about how it works. I know the answer to this question because I'm looking at it. But um, for people who haven't seen this before, can you talk a little bit about how, how does this know where your hands are? Sure. Um, let, yes, so. The technology of this is not really, well, I'm not very excited about it. I think it's, just, it's kind of simple. Um, it's just six infrared sensors, like one, two, three, four, five, six. And um, an infrared sensor basically looks, looks up in whatever direction you're facing it, and it tells the computer uh, how far near you are. So let's say this is, this is zero and this is like 100. So w within that given range of data, you can say, if the number is between zero and 20, play this sample. If the number is between 20 and 40, play this, um, this sample. And so I just have six of those. And actually, I have six individual microcontrollers for each one. Uh, at first, I thought I would just use one microcontroller. Um, if that makes sense, there are plenty of pins on a development board. But actually, in terms of the way it steps through the code, there was, there's some delay, and if, if one is happening, it'll say, if that, then it'll, it'll be delayed to respond to the other one. So if I wanted to be able to play all six at once, I wanted them to be computing in parallel, basically. Um, and that's it. So you, you say you're not excited. In this object, I'm myself. Right. Not so much the sensing technology, but the way that you're able to play it is what's Yeah. Important. And I would also love um, other people to play this. Um, it would be amazing for just my interest in general to build many of these and have other people find it so satisfying that say, I want to play air marimba. I want to teach my children air marimba. Like, I, I'll teach you air marimba lessons if you like. Um, so that relationship between instrument and performer. And now some of this is... So Tell us about yourself. Hi, my name is uh, Xavier Von Birch, and I'm from the Netherlands. And um, I was originally planning to do a sort of... Um, compact version of the live show I've been doing for a couple of years now. But uh, that soon turned out to be uh, a bit too much uh, for the scope of this event. So what I've uh, decided to do is to bring just a couple of instruments and um, show you what they do, tell you a little bit about it, and in the meantime, show you some pictures of how they are normally used and uh, what I normally do. Because what for me is very important in um, music, or in general, especially live music, of course, is uh, physicality. Like, uh, and um, when I studied sonology in the 90s, there was all this uh, laptop uh, stuff going on, Mego label, and you would see somebody in total darkness lit by his screen, and you would hear all this digital noise, which, you know, is fascinating, but I always missed this sort of performance aspect of it. And um, so I took things uh, in a slightly different direction. I went back to totally analog and lo-fi stuff. Um, this was actually my first uh, hi-fi set here, this machine. <laughs> and um, actually, this machine has a, has a very big historical uh, importance uh, for me personally. Because um, I've had it since I was uh, like eight years old or something. And um, after a while, it started behaving slightly odd. Like if I was recording tapes, I was never really quite sure what would end up on the tape. It would sometimes leave stuff that was already there, or it would make all these weird noises over it. Um, I also started experimenting with overdubbing and um, well, coming from a more classical musical background, I played piano and violin as a kid. Um, I got into synthesizer, uh, at first more this uh, poppy stuff. And then at some point I, I noticed that I could also make music by just playing with the edit functions on the synthesizer, just altering the sound. And uh, that was like, well, the best thing that ever happened to me, really, I, I opener. Because <laughs> I got so fed up with notes and chords and stuff. Um, so this all started uh, falling together, and um, I'm still using this as of today uh, in a slightly different way. Um, I will get to that soon. So first, um, I would like to show you some uh, photos. Now this is what I would normally be performing with. Um, this is a test setup in my old uh, studio. 
lots of stuff here. Uh, analog synthesizer, uh, some oscillators, this is a you know, matrix mixer, tape delay, this is uh, old tube uh, equipment, this is a distortion meter, a very uh, steep filter that I feedback. There's a broken down tube amp which makes funny noises. Uh, this here is a variac, it's actually the power source for these two machines uh, because what I do is I don't feed them enough uh, electricity uh, and that makes them behave uh, strange. Here I have uh, an old analog drum machine that I've modified. Uh, here's another drum machine that I've modified. This is just a delay, some filters and a bunch of mixers to connect it all together. Um, here's another one, uh, live uh, setup. Just a closer look. I usually bring an oscilloscope as well to check what's going on uh, because as you can imagine there's a fairly large chance of something not working. Uh, but then again that's kind of the point um, because um, the other thing I'm interested in in uh, electronic music is that uh, stuff can go wrong but uh, that actually sometimes or well, depends how you deal with it has very interesting results. So this, this is something that sort of, well, got out of hand more and more in <laughs> this fascination. And I ended up dragging these uh, 500 kilo of equipment with me, setting it up for hours and, and always swearing that something doesn't work, but uh, at the same time remembering that that was the original point. Like it's supposed to sometimes not work because it uh, will push me into other directions as well. Um, because, well, I do follow a sort of a fixed structure in this performance, but uh, most of it is completely improvised and completely depends on whatever those instruments decide to do at that point. Uh, I know in very large um, lines what they are capable of and how I can squeeze certain things out of them, but they keep surprising me from time to time. Um, let me just uh, quickly go on here. Yeah, this is the tape machine again, I mean the distortion meter again. Most of it I also connect in rather, <coughs> well, not the official way, let's put it that way. <coughs> um, and um, well, I've replaced that with a spoon. Um, at some point they will start spinning too fast, so I have to keep switching it on and off uh, from time to time to have the maximum vibration of the spoon. Uh, this is also amplified through a yeah, contact mic. Sometimes it refuses. Sometimes I need to interfere a little bit with it. Normally what's supposed to happen is that it starts feedbacking over the subs. Unfortunately I don't have those now. I can put some now. That's nice. So I start the show with uh, doing a little ritual with this thing. I fill it up with uh, absinthe and water <coughs> um, because absinthe has a very nice uh, green color and also um, it uh, changes color when you mix it with water because the idea of this thing is that it's kind of the, um, uh, the magic potion that makes this whole show happen. Uh, I should probably also tell you that I normally wear a lab coat in this uh, performance. <laughs> This was probably one of the largest setups I've ever had. Um, well, because I lived right next to the venue at that point. <laughs> I was lucky. <laughs> Here I'm, I am using a computer, um, but normally I prefer not to. So, um, I'll go to the next series. Where's my mouse? Right, so, here we go, absent. Um, and during the show, I, I keep drinking from this um, to kind of enhance the realistic uh, mad science uh, aspect. 
It has happened that I didn't quite remember the end of my show, but <laughs> normally um, I'm fine. <coughs> uh, anyway, the, this uh, starts with a bit of noise here, and the pouring, and the spoon starts turning. I built a little light in it, so uh, the, the liquid lights up from inside. And then I start adding some sounds, like for example the, the radio waves. It's the actual radio for the Builds up and then slowly the the next uh, part starts, uh, which is the the drone bit. Uh, for that purpose, I have always had uh, this device here. This is what I call the electric didgeridoo. Uh, it's basically just an air pump, and um, I'll show you what it does. I usually loop this or put lots of delay over it and uh, build up this uh, layer of uh, buzzes. I, I just love 50 hertz, it's my favorite sound. Um, and I start adding more of those, <clears throat> like this one for example. This is always uh, fun with the sound engineers when I turn this thing on. Um, it's now in the tape mode, and um, this is where the tape heads used to be. There's a little three band equalizer. I prefer the tape there. slowly evolves into this ever-expanding uh, massive 50 hertz uh, mass. Um, I start adding analog synths, uh, play with the filters a bit. Um, then gradually some rhythm comes in, uh, then it goes into this sort of um, disco bit, uh, which I cannot show you because I have nothing uh, of that uh, part. Um, I, I try to change the setup with every show, um, just to keep myself amused as well. 
And uh, so sometimes I use computer for the beats, uh, but I try to avoid it. Uh, I prefer the analog stuff. For yeah, I know if something goes wrong with analog equipment, it sounds nicer somehow. <laughs> um, anyway, this this uh, uh, beat stuff starts getting a bit out of hand. Um, I'm still drinking from the absinthe, imagine. And um, wait, what happened to the video? Okay, so I'll show you some of that. Let's go a bit larger here. I love B-movies. <laughs> um, there we go. Yeah. Then we get to this part. And this is where the fun starts. So again, the same uh, device. By the way, I call this the Screech box. Uh, now I just do the Crackle box, developed by Stein, by Michel. Um, but this one, makes a bit more noise, so I call it screech box. In Dutch it's kraakdoos for crackle box and krijsdoos for this one here. So now I'm in the phono, now I'm in the phono mode. I usually uh, take this from underneath my sleeve. Um, wait, can you? <laughs> Tangle for a moment in your. Uh... Yeah. Let's uh, take some practice. <laughs> well, I can do it quite fast. That's been a while. Anyway, there's always lots of noise in the background, so uh, you know, I feel comfortable stepping back a little bit. So there's not usually this uh, silence that we have. No, that no, no, in. absolutely not. No. Um, so this uh, uh, here is a uh, lamp, as you can see. Uh, normally I control it with a dimmer um, to sort of make a nice uh, fade in at the beginning. And uh, I use it also for sound purposes. Compact fluorescent, so we're low carbon. Thank yeah. you, IKEA.
So this is all sort of going on at the same time. And then uh, we get to the... Oh, yeah. We get to the next stage of the performance, which is where smoke starts coming out. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. Well, let me just uh, push this back here. So, uh, next chapter. Uh, it's very difficult with my left hand. Uh, yeah, so smoke. So we'll have, to, we'll have to use some of our imagination to imagine the rest of this. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> Well, that's why I brought the pictures. So I'll just quickly go through them. Well, I think we, we think we may have to move on. We're yeah, sort of running out of time. So I, I just want to. <laughs> although I have. To say, <laughs> I have to say now that I've seen. I see, this was Colorado that I saw you in. Right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Community. Um, so uh, having seen this performance. Now, kind of knowing some of the pieces behind it, I think I wouldn't have known otherwise. So okay. this, is, uh, <laughs> this is what happens after the smoke. Yeah? Can, I, can, I just think, can you make the sound? Sure. Last uh, impression. Oh, yeah, this beautiful rhythm. <laughs> 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 